Hey folks, welcome to another video. In this video, we're going to be discussing about an important lysosomal storage disorder, the Gosch's disease. Let's get started by learning a little bit of introduction about Gosch's disease. Gosch's disease is an inborn error of metabolism that affects the recycling of cellular glycolipids. It is an autosomal recessive disorder that results from a deficiency of the enzyme acid beta-glucosidase, which is more popularly known as the beta-glucocerebrosidase. It occurs due to mutations in the gene glucocerebrosidase type 1, abbreviated as GBA1, which is located on the long arm of chromosome number 1, locus 21. Glucocerebrosidase, which is otherwise known as glucocerebroside, which is also called as glucosal ceramide, and several related compounds that are ordinarily degraded to glucose and lipid components accumulate within the lysosomes of the cells. Now pay close attention to the word glucocerebroside or glucosal ceramide. Now you'll find that there are two components, the gluco part and the cerebroside or the ceramide part. The gluco part represents the glucose moiety and the cerebroside or the ceramide part represents that there is a lipid component, so it's a combination of both glucose and lipid particle together. There are several different types of Gosch's disease. There are type 1, type 2, and type 3. The type 1 is a non-neuronopathic form. The type 2 is an acute neuronopathic form. And the type 3 is also called the subacute or chronic neuronopathic form of Gosch's disease. Now let's dive deep into the pathogenesis of the disease. In affected patients, the deficiency of glucocerebrosidase leads to accumulation of glucocerebroside and other glycolipids within the lysosomes of macrophages. The deacylated form of glucosal ceramide and glucosal spingosin is particularly elevated in the brain in patients with neuronopathic disease and may have a role in the pathogenesis of neurodegeneration. Now recall that neuronopathic disease is type 2 and type 3 Gosch's disease. The clinical manifestations of Gosch's disease result from accumulation of the lipid-laden macrophages in the liver, in the spleen, in the bone marrow, the bone, and other tissues and organs. The additional increase in the organ weight and volume is attributed to an inflammatory and hyperplastic cellular response and the pathologic lipid accumulation in macrophages accounts for less than 2% of the additional tissue mass in the liver and spleen. The gaseous cells and neighboring macrophages overexpress and secrete lysosomal proteases such as the catepsins and inflammatory mediators such as the interleukin-6 interleukin-8, and interleukin-10, along with macrophage inflammatory proteins, the MIP1-alpha and the MIP1-beta. Along with these, certain chemotactic factors such as cysteine, X16 motif chemokine ligands 2, 9, 10, and 11 are also being produced in this disease. Gosh's disease involves the visceral organs, the bone marrow and bone, in almost all affected patients. However, the Gosch's disease type 1 is distinguished from type 2 and type 3 by the lack of characteristic involvement of the central nervous system, although there have been studies that have documented. As for the common manifestations in Gosch's disease in all types, fatigue is common, and there can also be pubertal delay with associated delay in growth. Splenomegaly is the most common presenting sign. Hepatomegaly can also occur, but the liver size increases relatively less in comparison with spleen. Hepatic fibrosis may occur, but hepatic failure, cirrhosis and portal hypertension are uncommon in patients with Gosch's disease. There are several pathologic processes that occur within the bone, which includes a decreased mineral density of the bone, bone marrow infiltration, and infarction of the bone. 
The mechanisms leading to decreased bone mineral density include failure to achieve a peak bone mass, abnormal osteoclast regulation, or overproduction of cytokines by activated macrophages. Bone marrow fibrosis and osteosclerosis result in localized loss of hematopoiesis, which leads to pancytopenia, hence anemia, thrombocytopenia, or rarely leukopenia may be present simultaneously or independently. The thrombocytopenia results from splenic sequestration and occasionally bone marrow failure. The increased bleeding tendency in patients with type 1 Gaucher's disease is related to thrombocytopenia, coagulation abnormalities, and also defective platelet function. Another important clinical manifestation is characterized by diffuse bone pain, punctuated by painful crises that often result in osteonecrosis with subsequent joint collapse affecting the proximal and distal femur, the proximal tibia, and the proximal humerus, osteolytic lesions, pathologic fractures, vertebral compression fractures, and other fragility fractures associated with low bone mineral density also do occur in patients with Gaucher's disease. Many affected children grow poorly and have delayed puberty, hampering their growth and development. Interstitial lung disease is a less common manifestation, although when it occurs, the Gaucher cells infiltrate the alveolar spaces and interstitium. Neurologic manifestations such as peripheral polyneuropathy are reported in type 1 Gaucher's disease even though it is non-neuronopathic. It is also associated with Parkinson's disease. Both homozygous and heterozygous mutations in GBA1 are associated with a variety of Parkinson phenotypes including those that are earlier in onset and more progressive than non gaucher associated Parkinson's disease. It has been noted that there are increased rates of malignancies, particularly the hematologic malignancies like lymphomas, leukemias, multiple myelomas in patients with Gaucher's disease. Type 2 Gaucher's disease is characterized by early onset which typically occurs in the first year after birth. Visceral involvement is more extensive and severe, and infants may present clinically with congenital ichthyosis, and hence such babies are known as collodion babies. The first sign of central nervous system disease typically occurs as oculomotor dysfunction, which may include strabismus, or as saccade initiation abnormalities, or bulbar palsy or paresis. Children with saccadic initiation abnormalities may compensate for lack of saccades by moving their head to shift their gaze. Neurologic progression is marked by severe hypertonia, rigidity, and arching of the back, giving an ophistotonous posture, swallowing impairment, and seizures. The diagnosis of Gaucher's disease is by visualizing macrophages filled with lipid material known as the Gaucher cells and are a cardinal feature of this disease. Gaucher's cells have a characteristic histologic appearance of a wrinkled tissue paper. Anemia and thrombocytopenia typically are found on blood counts. Liver enzymes may be mildly elevated and serum Angiotensin converting enzyme may also be increased. Acid phosphatase activity, particularly the tartarate resistant isoenzyme, is elevated. On imaging, the characteristic Erlenmeyer flask deformity of the distal femur caused by abnormal modeling of the metaphysis is seen in about half defected patients, although this finding is not specific for Gaucher's disease. Here's a radiological image, an x-ray, of the distal portion of the femur showing the Erlenmeyer flask deformity. Here's a lateral spine radiograph of acutely angled kyphosis in a patient with type 3 Gaucher's disease. This deformity is termed the gibbous deformity, like that of an ape. Here's a histopathological image of a patient with Gaucher's disease on his bone marrow aspirate. 
demonstrating the tissue paper wrinkle macrophages termed as the Gaucher cells, which is shown here with the arrow marks. The bone marrow aspirate showing a large number of macrophages laden with cerebrocytes. The Gaucher cells are shown here in this patient with Gaucher's disease. The cytoplasm has a pattern that has been likened to a wrinkle silk or crumble newspaper which can be clearly demonstrated here in the center field demonstrating a macrophage. Here is another histopathological image showing a number of red blood cells on the peripheries and several macrophages in the center of the field. Three large macrophages can be clearly demarcated with crumbled tissue paper like cytoplasm with a central nucleus. The treatment options available for Gaucher's disease. Gaucher's disease can be treated with enzyme replacement therapy, substrate reduction therapy, and certain other treatment modalities. Enzyme replacement therapy. The decision to offer Gaucher specific therapy with enzyme replacement or substrate reduction in patients with non neuronopathic Gaucher's disease is based upon the disease severity and determined by the initial assessment or significant disease progression, which is demonstrated through regular follow-ups. Enzyme replacement therapy with a recombinant glucocerebrosidase or substrate replacement therapy with eliglustat are the preferred treatments for patients with clinically significant manifestations of non-neuronopathic Gaucher's disease. Enzyme replacement therapy with imiglucirase or valaglucirase is also an option in patients with chronic neuronopathic Gaucher's disease who have visceral manifestations and in patients at risk for type 3 Gaucher's disease. But it is not suitable for patients with acute neuronopathic Gaucher's disease which is the type 2 Gaucher's disease. Substrate reduction therapy. Substrate reduction therapy which reduces glycolipid accumulation by decreasing the synthesis of glucocerebroside, which is a substrate of the deficient enzyme, is an alternative to enzyme replacement therapy for some adult patients. Eliglustat is approved for a broader range of use than meglustat in this regard. Eliglustat has been approved as a first-line therapy for adults with type 1 Gaucher's disease. Other treatment options available for Gaucher's disease include splenectomy, bone marrow transplantation, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and novel gene therapies. The availability of ERTs have limited the indications for splenectomy. Before ERT was available, splenectomy was performed to improve thrombocytopenia and anemia. Splenectomy is indicated if other measures fail to control life-threatening thrombocytopenia in patients with Gaucher's disease. Bone marrow transplantation may also be considered a viable option in patients known to be at risk for neuronopathic disease who present early in the disease course. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation can provide a definitive cure for Gaucher's disease. However, this procedure is associated with substantial morbidity and mortality and therefore has been effectively replaced by the enzyme replacement therapy and the substrate reduction therapy in clinical practice. That concludes our video on Gaucher's disease.